Don, here is your gift. Let me see. Rory, here is yours. Justin, here you are. And where is Travis? He's in Oklahoma, and this is for Travis, representing Travis. <laughs> He's with Kronberg Boy. Guys, thank you very much for being uh, my elders for many years. This is a book, Making of a Leader. It's a very transformational book in my mind. And one of the reasons was it really helps you to find out where you are in your leadership and also to see how God has providentially helped you to get there. And so it was a huge blessing in my life, and I wanted to give it to my elders. Also, I want to thank this congregation. Seven years. That's a long time for preachers to be with a congregation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now sometimes the minister leaves and sometimes the congregation leaves and you know, all know what I mean by that. Uh, I'm honored that I have been your minister for seven years. We have gone through a lot of growth. We've had a lot of blessings. We have had a lot of opportunities. And I want to say something to our guests. If you are a guest today, when you are looking for a congregation, this is a stable congregation. The minister's been here for seven years. Don't plan on leaving. We're bringing in another guy. We are continuing to add to the fold. We have stable an eldership, a long history of an eldership. You don't have to worry about that going bad. This is a place for you because it's a place that is stable that you can serve the Lord. So now that I'm done with my commercial, thank you for letting me be your minister for seven years. You may not know this, but a lot of congregations vote on you. You can come to a congregation, and a congregation will put your names forward, and you are not allowed to be a member of that congregation until the members vote you in or out. I would think that would be so nerve-wracking to know. That you would have to be given as your name to the congregation. Then you'd have to sit there and they would say, we're going to bring up this name. And if anybody would like for them to be a member of this congregation, raise your hand. And they would raise their hand. And if anybody objects to that member, I'd be like, <laughs> seeing if they put any hands up. And some would be like, and I'd be like. That's not my first friend here. But there's actually congregations that vote on you. That they will literally have a vote if you are allowed into that church or not. Now we here at Castle Rock and in the Churches of Christ, we do not vote on you. If you are added to the body of Christ, you are in the body of Christ and you are a member of our congregation. But I wonder sometimes, do we vote with our feet, perhaps? Where we see people and do we prejudge them? We sit back and think, I think I can be that person's friend, or I'm really glad they're here, or mm, I don't know about that person. They may be able to attend, but I'm not really sure I'm glad they're part of our congregation. And so do we do silent voting sometimes? Do we maybe condemn others who do a public vote, but do we do it in our hearts and we judge those in our hearts? Probably a lot of times when we start to judge people of if they should be a member of our congregation, we're probably getting it wrong. God has different views of who is in the church and who's not in the church uh, than a lot of humans do. Humans usually judge very much on the outside appearance, but ju God judges the heart. And sometimes we may make a judgment and we're totally wrong on it because we're judging things that God does not judge. We're looking at maybe social economic wealth. We're looking at good looks. We're looking at various outside appearances that are really not an indication of true spirituality. You see this vote taking place in this story that surrounds Cornelius. Cornelius is a landmine in the history of the church. He is thrown out into the church and all of a sudden the church sits back and they start to fight and debate and they argue about should he be in here or not. 
here's what happens, and here's the beginning. And as we continue our series on For All, as we look at who belongs to the body of Christ, we are going to look at Cornelius and look at the ramifications of what happens when this man becomes a Christian. Look at Acts chapter 10, verse 1 to 8. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, and he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants, a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now in the Gospel of Luke, there's this foreshadowing of the Gentile mission. And it's very much the idea of who belongs and who doesn't belong. There is something that was very radical about this idea that a Gentile could be included. What has happened in the Jewish religion was that it has become so solidified, nothing ever changed. It was so kind of developed that nobody knew was coming into it. Everybody knew all the unwritten rules of the church. Everybody knew the order of worship. Everybody knew what was to be expected. Everybody knew all the culture in the congregation. And so nothing ever happened that was odd. I kind of wonder in our congregation, when has something strange happened here? When was the last time something odd happened that was caused because somebody was outside of our Church of Christ tradition, or outside of the familiarity of Christianity, and they did something that was so different that you all sat back and said, Whoa, what just happened? Have we become such an organization? Have we become a church that we don't have any lost souls coming And don't know all of our unwritten rules. All of our kind of established habits. And they do something because they just didn't know any better. I'm not sure when strange things happen, it's always bad. Sometimes it's good because it means that you're actually reaching out into the world. People who aren't so familiar with us come in... And they don't know all the unwritten rules. They don't know how we do this or we do that. And so strange things happen sometimes. I'm not sure how comfortable we are with it. Now imagine if this family came and was worshiping with us. And this family was from the Middle East and they had a Muslim background. But they accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. They were baptized for their mission of their sins. But then they moved to America. And they walked into our congregation. One of the elders announced that we were going to have prayer. And so everybody stood up. And that family came and got right in the middle of this aisle. And got down on their knees. Because in the Middle East, Because of that Muslim background, when you prayed, you prostrated yourself. You would get down and you would bow. And so the Christian church over there, that's what they do when they pray. Because that was the culture of their day. That's how you would show reverence to God. And all of a sudden, this family that you don't know comes and they get down in the aisle and they pray. What would you do? How would you respond to it? Would you kind of look at them and be like, that's weird. Probably a lot of us would do nothing. Well, it happens sometimes. But would you do this? When you would see them down praying, wanting them to feel comfortable, would you ever get up from your chair 
and then go and bow with them. Let them know that we accept you. Would you ever even think about doing that? A lot of times we don't think about things that happen outside of our comfort zones. Because Cornelius to the Jews did not fit in. They didn't know what to do with this guy. He fit into no box. Look what it says in Acts chapter 10 verses 1 to 2. At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion who was known as the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God with all his household gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. Now, this Cornelius is a very famous man, a very powerful man. He is a soldier, first of all. He is also a powerful soldier. He would be in charge of a hundred soldiers. He is a leader among men. But there is something shocking here. Now, we know of his fighting background, but he is also a devout man who fears God. He is a god fear. So this means that he believes in monotheism, that he is attracted to the idea of God that the Jews hold. He is also a man who gives generously to the Jews and to their work because he respects the idea of there being one God. The only difference is that he is not circumcised and therefore he is not included or accepted among the Jews as he is. But because of his heart, God comes to him. Now this is very significant. A lot of times in the church, we only want to accept people or go to people once they are Christians. This man is not a Christian yet. But God goes to him. There's the principle of God that God doesn't just sit back and wait. He doesn't wait for you to get everything fixed up and figured out. God is a God who goes first. God is the one who goes to him and speaks to him and gets him to send to Peter that God is a God who comes. And if we know anything about God, that is the nature of our Lord. God always comes. He comes to earth. He comes to Cornelius. But when He does, He sets everything in chaos. Because all, all the Jews are going to sit back. And even Peter himself, who's a leader in the church, the same Peter who left eating a lunch with the Gentiles, he has to go to him and he struggles with even accepting him into the church. It's amazing what happens when you put labels on people. Now I remember this one church I worked with in the South and there was this religious controversy on this topic. And it was really fascinating to me what happened here. It was about some particular idea of what to do about a certain religious or a, a certain holiday, not a religious holiday, more of a paganistic holiday. And it was this argument, and the guy from up north was like, we should not involve ourselves in that as a church. Now, instead of dealing with the theology, the Bible, I found the majority of them said one thing. Well, he's a Yankee. How can you listen to him? He's a Yankee. Now, I'm in Colorado here. Now, if I'm the South, we all would know what that meant. That means they're up north, you know. Now, I used to get accused of being a Yankee. I always say I'm above the Yankees. <laughs> but this one individual, there is no need to respect him or his views or his opinion because if you could label him a Yankee, obviously he's wrong. We do that in the church. A lot of times we place a label on somebody of maybe liberal, conservative. Think about all some of the terms we use to so many people. And as soon as you can label somebody Gentile, you no longer have to listen. Labels are the greatest ways to discount somebody in their personhood. 
But God has a plan here. And look what happens in Acts chapter 10, verse 3 to 8. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. God comes to Cornelius. He comes to him. And he uses Peter to reach him because God wants him in the church. And now the local church is going to sit back and you know what they're going to do? They don't get to know Cornelius. They're not excited about Cornelius. The church sits back and fights about Cornelius. For the next five chapters in the book of Acts that Luke has even foreshadowed, saying that the Gentiles are going to be included in the kingdom of God. For the next five chapters, all the talk in the church is going to be about what are we going to do with all these Gentiles? All these Gentiles are getting saved, and we don't know if we like it or not. We don't know what we're going to do with all these Gentiles. Because it seems like God is working among the Gentiles, and all the church did was stand back, huddle in a circle, and sit there and say, well, I don't know if I'm for that or not. Well, I'm not sure if that's correct. I don't know if that's biblical. They sat back and thought about it. They didn't sit back and embrace it. They thought about it. They thought about people coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. In the southern church I worked at, they had this one lady. And this one lady, and I want you to hear what I say here, had identity confusion from birth. I hope you know what that means. She was born with identity confusion. She did not choose to have identity confusion. She was born that way. She would come to church, but she wouldn't come and sit where you're all sitting today. We had a hall behind the baptistry that you could come in through a door, and you could come, and there were some of these stairs And you could sit there by the baptistry. And in town, she would always talk to me, and I'd talk to her. And the reason she would talk to me, because she wanted to tell me about my sermons. She would thank me for my sermons. She would also tell me when she disagreed with my sermons. But do you know why she always sat by herself by the baptistry? Because she never felt comfortable in our congregation. Now, I remember our congregation, and it was a good congregation, but you know what we used to do? We used to fight about what to do with her. What were we going to do with her? How were we going to handle this? What was the right thing for us to do. Because if we show support, are we supporting something? We don't know what we're supposed to be supporting. If we show acceptance, are we accepting something? We don't know if we should be showing acceptance. And I sat there, and we would argue and fight and debate and bicker, and some people would say we should do this, and some people would say we should do that. And so instead of her coming and sitting in the auditorium to hear the message She knew there were some people that didn't want her there. And so she sat by herself in the back by the baptistry. But do you know one thing that I never saw us do? One thing we never did? Nobody ever got up and sat with her. Nobody ever stood up Because she was there every week and went to sit with her. 
So often we argue about who can be in and who can be out. But have we ever sat back and said, you know, maybe I will join you in the aisle in prayer. I will join you in the back by the baptistry. Because I know one thing I can do. And that's I can show some love and kindness to people who are struggling in life. Cornelius wasn't saved yet. But God still went to him. Because that is the nature of God. God comes to you first. While you were yet sinners, Jesus came to earth. The principle is God comes. And because He comes to us first, we are given the opportunity to be saved. If we will believe, confess, repent, be baptized for the mission of your sins, rise up out of that water to newness of life. And you have that opportunity to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song. I hear